the last video, I have taken a first look at conspiracy theories and discussed different theoretical conceptions as to why they are appealing for people. If you haven't watched that video yet, I would recommend doing that first and then returning to this video, as basic definitions and conceptions I talk about have been explained and discussed in that video. In the second part of my review of conspiracy theories, I want to talk about the problems that conspiracy theories raise. Criticizing conspiracy theories has become increasingly popular within media outlets due to the influence that certain conspiratorial narratives such as Pizzagate and QAnon had on recent political events, especially revolving around the COVID-19 pandemic and the presidential term of office of Donald Trump. These public critiques, however, often tend to simplify the actual context and circumstances in favor of a sensational rhetoric. The term COVIDiot, for example, that was popularized when conspiracy theorists started protesting against the political precautions to prevent the spreading of COVID-19, holds the implication of intellectual inferiority of those that follow certain conspiratorial narratives. In this video, I will try and provide a differentiated analysis of the problems conspiracy theories raise, based on the critical literature I have reviewed. An important remark I want to make before I start is that when I'm going to be talking about conspiracy theories, I will be talking about such theories that I identified as conspiracy ideologies in my last video. Such an ideology differs from what German political scientist Armin Faltraugba calls a conspiracy hypothesis in the sense that the conspiracy hypothesis is verifiable, which means that any evidence against the hypothesis can revise it. A conspiracy ideology, on the other hand, is a closed system in the sense that evidence against the conspiracy theory does not revise the theory. Therefore, I'm not denying the fact that conspiracies have happened or can happen. So there are several different critical cases that are made against conspiracy theories. The first type of critique I want to talk about revolves around the assumption of a problematic ideological influence of conspiracy theories, which often include narratives of racist and anti-Semitic content that depict a worldview in which there is always a clear enemy, which is usually a particular group of people that is demonized by the conspiracy theorists. It was, after all, a conspiracy theory that justified one of the biggest genocides of human history, which was the systematic extinction of around 6 million European Jews between 1941 and 1945. The roots of modern anti-Semitism can be traced back to the Middle Ages, where Jewish people were accused of holding secret meetings in which they conspired to poison the wells from which people would get their drinking water. This explanation was even more successful due to the fact that there was no conception of germs in the Middle Ages, while the possibility of poisoning someone was well understood. Therefore, deaths that were actually related to the Black Plague were pushed on the Jews. The well poisoning conspiracy theory led to the violent persecution of Jewish communities between the years 1348 to 1351. While the massacres would eventually stop with the waning of the Black Plague, the negative perceptions of Jewish communities remain until this day. The anti-Semitism of the 20th century was embedded in a particular type of conspiracy theory that was fed by narratives such as those within the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This fabricated document supposedly contains the transcript of a speech of an unknown Jewish leader in which he reveals a conspiracy plotted by Jews and Freemasons against the rest of the world. While any evidence on their authenticity has never been found, they still found many believers. The origin of this document, which first appeared in the year 1903 in Russia, is unknown. It is possible that this anonymity was helpful in reinforcing the skepticism of people that believed in their authenticity. The popularity of this document only really began after the First World War, when they provided a simple explanation within complicated and difficult times of societal change in the early 1920s related to the collapse of monarchy and economical crisis. The documents were translated into several languages and began their march around the world. In England, the Times Magazine printed them, and in the USA, anti-Semite Henry Ford published them in his own newspaper. In his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf Hitler himself wrote that he is convinced that these documents must be real due to the fact that the Frankfurter Zeitung, a German newspaper outlet, says that they are based on a forgery. 
The protocols later became a strong propaganda tool for the Nazi party. The Nazis printed and spread hundreds of thousands of copies of them and they were taught in German classrooms and within the Hitler Youth. Well, I guess after such horrific events, it is unthinkable that humans wouldn't be extremely suspicious of the protocols by now and be well enlightened enough about their dangerous influence, right? Well, quite honestly, the protocols of Zion are more popular than ever. The Christian Patriots, the White Aryans, the Jew Watchers, the Nation of Islam, the Palestine Liberation Organization, esoteric followers of the New Age, Orthodox Russian churches, communists who switched out the class enemy with the world conspiring Jew, masses of online conspiracy theorists all refer to this inherently anti-Semitic document. Another ideological branch of racist and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories stems from esoteric occultism. One of the earliest roots of this theoretical tradition are the writings of Russian occultist Helena Blavatsky. In one of her main works, The Secret Doctrine, from 1888, she claims that the Aryans are part of ancient civilizations that have become degenerated while being mixed up with other animal-like races. Some of the Aryans were able to build groups in different parts of the world though, keeping the Aryan race clean. The holy sign of these groups was the swastika. In her work, Blavatsky describes Africans as imbecile, while she states that Jews and Arabs are mentally degenerated. Later, occultists Guido von Liszt and Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels connected Blavatsky's ideas to the Germanic mythology. Hitler was directly inspired by both of them. Liszt claimed the Germanic race needed a strong leader, which Hitler saw himself as. Von Liebenfels, on the other hand, claimed the idea of a blonde heroic race, which the Nazis later adapted. But just as the influence of the protocols, esoteric anti-Semitic conspiracy theories didn't vanish. In Germany, the most popular modern example of esoteric right-wing conspiracy theories are probably the writings of Jan Udo Holly, who wrote the book Geheimgesellschaften, released under his pseudonym Jan van Helsing, which can be translated into secret societies. The book talks about some of the most popular conspiracy theories in which secret societies such as the Freemasons and the Bilderberg Group are plotting since centuries on behalf of the Illuminati. But apart from these conventional narratives, Holly also talks about a conspiracy of rich Jewish rabbis and bankers. He also draws direct connections to the protocols of the elders of Zion. Apart from the protocols, he also refers to neo-Nazis and Holocaust deniers, such as David Irving and Gemma Rudolf. Around two years after its release, Geheimgesellschaften was confiscated due to a file that was charged by the Jewish community in Mannheim. But the book had already gained popularity, having sold around 100,000 legal copies. Apart from that, Holly continued to release books that haven't been banned, using more subtle ways of promoting his anti-Semitic narratives, such as just talking about conspiring bankers. The trope of the conspiring bankers is very popular among anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which is why it makes sense to listen well and think twice if someone is talking about bankers who control everything. We shouldn't underestimate how conspiracy theories, due to their often racist and anti-Semitic content, can be incredibly dangerous, having literally justified one of the worst crimes of human history. They hold the potential of dehumanizing people by mystifying them into evil alien forces that try to take over the world and destroy everything that is loved and appreciated by the people that they conspire against. As American historian Richard Hofstadter writes, the central image is that of a vast and sinister conspiracy, a gigantic and yet subtle machinery of influence set in motion to undermine and destroy a way of life. Since the enemy is thought of as being totally evil and totally unappeasable, he must be totally eliminated, if not from the world, at least from the theater of operations to which the paranoid directs his attention. The capability of conspiracy theories to make groups of people, especially minority groups, seem inherently evil, dehumanizes them and opens up possibilities for violence against them. But couldn't we say that there's more harmless conspiracy theories that don't really imply dangerous ideological anti-Semitic or racist ideas? 
While clearly not all conspiracy theories hold racist assumptions or lead back to certain anti-Semitic canards, it should be pointed out that anti-Semitism isn't really the exception within modern popular conspiracy theories. The theory of blood-drinking pedophiles that makes up the core narrative of the most popular conspiracy theories of our time, Pizzagate and QAnon, derives from the classic historical anti-Semitic canard of blood libel which states that Jews are murdering Christian children to use their blood for ritualistic purposes. Many of the modern UFO conspiracy theories refer to the Zion Protocols or borrow anti-Semitic canards linking them to theories about the superiority of certain ancient alien or spiritual races. Philosopher Karl Popper criticized the tendency of conspiracy theories to shift responsibility for events towards individuals, as opposed to understanding something through more comprehensive explanations, under the term psychologism. Popper says it would be impossible for societal events to always be planned and intended by individuals, but that this is exactly the assumption of conspiracy theorists. He writes, this view of the aims of the social sciences arises, of course, from the mistaken theory that whatever happens in society, especially happenings such as war, unemployment, poverty, shortages, which people as a rule dislike, is the result of direct design by some powerful individuals and groups. While not denying the fact that real conspiracies occur and have occurred, Popper says that real conspiracies are likely to fail. He says that in relation to the complexity of societal events, human action rarely can be as planned and intentional as conspiracy theorists imply. The problem for Papa is not that humans have intentions and that they act upon them. The problem derives because conspiracy theorists explain occurring social phenomenon and events through the individual psychology of groups of people that had everything that occurred willed in the exact way it occurred. There is no room for coincidence or unpredictable social dynamics within conspiracy beliefs. British scientist Peter Knight points out how conspiracies by definition require human agency as a necessary condition. Someone plotting without any intention wouldn't really be plotting. Similarly to the act of conspiring, the idea of a plot involves the necessity of a plan and a plan requires intent. A conspiracy only is a conspiracy if certain people are secretly and willfully controlling certain events. Conspiracy theorists therefore assume that the outcomes of events are planned to a high degree. Knight points out how such a strong notion of human intent is problematic because not all societal events can be traced back to individual intentions. He uses the example of certain patriarchal power relations in which the positions of power that men and women inhabit often aren't conserved because of the conscious intent of men to do so, but rather through subtle and unconscious behavioral patterns and attitudes. Conspiracy beliefs underestimate such factors by always explaining societal events as direct causations of human intent. This particularly becomes a problem within the idea of conspiracy beliefs. Conspiracy beliefs aren't just theories about certain singular events that were secretly planned or involved plotting, but instead involve huge plots for world domination and strong connections between different events. As Michael Bakun points out, within conspiracy beliefs, everything is connected and everything was planned. These theories claim a degree of intent and interconnected organization that becomes particularly problematic if we acknowledge the idea that human action and societal events aren't always intentional. Of course this is not to say that certain events can't be planned. It's more about the degree of agency that conspiracy theories often imply. Within conspiracy beliefs, almost every single societal event is explained as part of the conspiracy, which means that all those events must be seen as causations of human intent. This leads me to another point I want to talk about, which is the particular ideological nature of these types of conspiracy beliefs. In the first part, where we talked about reasons as to why people believe in conspiracy theories, I already mentioned the notion of pervasive skepticism that American philosopher Brian Keeley used to describe the particularity of conspiracy beliefs. An attitude of pervasive skepticism is defined by the fact that any external evidence against the belief of the pervasive skepticist will be interpreted as evidence in support of given belief. Now, such an attitude presents the conspiracy believer with a problem. 
If a belief system is defined by a rigidness which doesn't allow for certain conflicts and paradoxes to be addressed, such a belief system inhabits the characteristics of an ideology. German social philosopher Rahel Yegi defined ideologies as beliefs that are regressive in the sense that they limit the ways certain conflicts or problems can be understood, which makes them an inherently deficitary belief system. In his book Collapse, historian, geographer and anthropologist Jared Diamond discusses the reasons as to why certain societies and cultures fail. Failure or collapse in his definition means a high decrease of the size of the population of such societies. One example Diamond uses to describe such a collapse is the culture of the Greenland Norse, a tribe of Vikings that populated Greenland around the year 980. Within around 400 years, the Viking colony vanished. Diamond sees one of the major factors for the collapse of the Greenland Norse in their cultural behaviors and practices. Unlike the Inuit, that had perfectly adapted their cultural practices towards the Greenlandic climate, the Vikings didn't and instead hung on to practices and traditions that weren't suitable for the environment. This was what ultimately led to their societal collapse. Accordingly, Yegi now defines ideologies as regressive belief systems that prevent certain conflicts that occur from being solved by providing a limited understanding of certain problems and situations. If we apply this to conspiracy theories, the pervasive skepticism similarly limits the possibilities of conspiracy theories to understand certain problems and events. Just like with the non-adaptive practices of the Vikings, a belief system of pervasive skepticism in which every information will always be interpreted in favor of the belief system itself will make it impossible to understand certain conflicts and problems. So the theoretical explanations I have presented so far all pretty much portray conspiracy theories as a deficitary form of knowledge. But there is a different branch of explanations that I've already talked about in the first part, which comes from cultural studies and the sociology of knowledge, standing in the tradition of Foucault's post-structuralism and Luckman and Berger's famous sociological study, the social construction of reality. Contrarily to the theories that depict conspiracy theories as ideologically problematic, there is nothing particularly different with knowledge about conspiracy theories within this perspective. Instead, from this perspective, the question arises why these belief systems are stigmatized in the first place. Accordingly, the whole discourse about conspiracy theories and with that the critique against conspiracy believers is seen as being embedded in certain power relations. Therefore, there is a shift from analyzing why conspiracy theories emerge and why conspiracy theorists believe in them towards questioning the overall discourse itself. Conspiracy theories are seen as a form of heterodox knowledge that doesn't represent the orthodox knowledge that reflects the interests of the leading culture of the political mainstream. The term conspiracy theory is used to discredit and devalue this heterodox form of knowledge and stigmatize whoever believes in it. The tone of mainstream media tries to suggest a superior scientific rationality contrasted against the inferior mythologies of conspiracy believers. According to cultural scientist Michael Butta, this hasn't always been this way though. He points out that historically conspiracy theories have usually rather been considered orthodox knowledge. In the 1950s, for example, American presidents Truman and Eisenhower, Senator McCarthy and FBI chef J. Edgar Hoover all believed in anti-communist conspiracy theories, which were also promoted through mainstream media. Historically, conspiracy theories were often very much established knowledge. Buddha writes how within Western culture this perception of conspiracy theories shifted with the 1960s. Their status as orthodox knowledge decreased and they increasingly shifted away from the public sphere. So it seems that we are dealing with a conflict here. On one hand we looked at perspectives that condemn conspiracy theories as dangerous and ideological. On the other hand, they appear as just another form of knowledge, while the way they are condemned as myths could appear as a way of keeping a certain power relation intact. In the next video, I want to try and resolve this seeming conflict by looking at the relationship between conspiracy theories and capitalism. Thank you very much for watching this video. There is going to be one more video coming up related to conspiracy theories. And then I'm really happy to move on to my next project. 
If you have any questions or anything else on your mind, please leave me a comment down below. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, uh, I would really appreciate if you could do that and leave me a like. And until next time, bye bye.